Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us today. We've got a, right now, we've got 1,075 people in our town hall. Uh, and so welcome to our uh, second virtual town hall meeting. I'm going to cover two major topics this morning. Um, and so let's move to the next slide, Ryan. <clears throat> Status of the uh, FY21 budget, which we are in day nine of the FY21 budget, will be our first topic. And then our second topic will be reopening plans. But uh, my focus is going to be on uh, masking options uh, for the fall. But we have many other people that are on the panel today, including David Hall, Dr. Cisco, Rachel Dockery, and others, that uh, if you have questions about specific pieces of the reopening plan, uh, we can take those uh, as well. We have five survey questions uh, that we will uh, use to seek input from you. Uh, your answers will be anonymous. We still cannot track who says what and don't want to. Uh, and so let's do the first question and see what groups of folks we have uh, participating. Andrea, let's roll that out. So please identify one staff, faculty, administration, or other. And so board members, uh, parents, students, community members, uh, uh, media should all click the other category. All right. Pull up results there. Can you pull up results for us, Andrea? Very good. Okay. Uh, all right. So after uh, we're going to do something a little different, we're uh, after each segment of uh, of my presentation, which I think will be ten to fifteen minutes each. We will take questions on those specific topics. Uh, after we cover the questions on the two topics that we referenced earlier, then we'll answer questions on any other topic if uh, time allows. I do have a, a noon stop that I have to stop by today. It's my uh, seven-year-old grandson's birthday and we are heading down to Arkansas and I've got to be walking out of here at noon uh, today. So that gives us two hours to cover as, uh, as much ground as we can. Uh, the town hall is designed for our employees, and so my plan today is to answer questions from faculty, staff, and administrators only. Um, please do not use, uh, and, and so uh, again, others can send me questions uh, by email, and I'll, I'll be happy to uh, respond to those. Um, you guys see the bottom, there are already some questions in the Q&A uh, section down there. Uh, please do not use the Q&A function to comment on what you hear. It, it becomes too hard for Suzanne Shaw, who's managing the questions, to get through them all if she's got to work through uh, comments on, on things. And so again, if you want to comment on anything, I, I want your comments, send them to me, president at missouristate.edu. I promise I'll read all the comments that come to me on email. And if you have questions, we'll make sure uh, they get answered that way if they're not answered uh, live today. Again, we are recording the session and we will be posting it on the university website so that you have an option to, if you missed, if people miss this, they can watch it there uh, or they can, um, uh, or you can go back and watch it again. Okay, we're going to roll on to uh, a question or uh, topic number one, and that's the FY21 budget. Uh, so on June 30, Governor Parson announced a withholding of almost $12 million in state appropriations for FY21, which began on July 1st. For the Springfield campus, that reduction is about $10,750,000. Um, when first announced, we thought it was $11.1 million. You may, have, you may have seen that number. But, but that was before the 3% withhold was, was taken off. And so uh, uh, we've drawn our first payment for July. We know the number exactly. And so the number that we've been reduced is $10,750,000. If you look on the chart that's on the screen right now, we had uh, predicted or assumed a reduction 
of $9,250,000 in state appropriations for the budget the Board of Governors passed. So we were short, or we missed that, by about $1.5 million. However, the withhold could have been significantly worse, which was why we were working on a pay reduction furlough policy when we last uh, talked. There are ways to close this gap. We've already began closing the gap. And so if you see on the chart, uh, our summer school revenue is up over our budgeted amount by about $600,000. And so now, you know, the gap has been reduced to right just slightly over $900,000, which we believe is manageable. Also, enrollment trends for the fall look better than anticipated, and we expect to receive some GEER, G-E-E-R, funds, which are part of the Federal CARES Act, which can help as well. As well. So for now, we're not going to move forward with any furlough or pay reductions. Let me say that again, we're not gonna move forward with any kind of furlough or pay reductions for FY21. That's good news. There are three caveats to that though. Uh, the first involves enrollment. Everybody on this call is engaged uh, somehow in, uh, in enrollment or interaction with students. And so please continue to work hard on enrollment. It is important that we continue to enroll students and that students who have already enroll don't fade away or melt away over the summer. Uh, please do everything in your power to support these goals. One thing we can all do is be responsive to students when we interact with them and their parents, adopt student-centric reopening policies and processes, and focus on friendly service. You know, for these reasons, I respond personally to every student parent email I get the same day I get it. Um, second caveat, we know that we could get another withhold later in the year. Uh, I believe and have good reason to believe the governor is predicting that this one withhold will be all that we need for the whole year, but, but circumstances change. And, and so remember this last year, we had two withholds. We had, we had one for about $7 million in April, and then we got another one for about $4 million in June. And so again, um, uh, circumstances can change, but, but for now, uh, we think we're, we can manage where we are. Finally, uh, be aware that there is still some uncertainty on when and how much and how we can use federal funds. We still have not received direction uh, from the state on the gear money, how much we get, when we get it, how we can use it. So again, there's some uncertainty uh, in that. We have said from day one that pay reductions or furloughs or layoffs will be used only as a last resort to balance the budget. So none will occur during the first quarter of FY21. I'm hopeful none will be necessary at all this year. If we do uh, get, if we, if we do it for some reason believe any of those measures will be necess are necessary, because we've gotten another large withholding or it's coupled with a larger than expected enrollment decline. We're prepared for that. Uh, we were gonna go through a policy with you today, but this development makes it unnecessary. If any of that changes for the reasons I've identified, we would certainly reconvene another town hall and continue discussions and address options at that time. Again, re reasonably good news. Uh, if a uh, six, you know, if a uh, uh, ten point eight million dollar reduction in funding can be good news, but uh, uh, we planned for it, and and, uh, and so that's where we are in terms of the budget uh, for now. Uh, you all remember that we created a budget that reduced revenue by sixteen point four million dollars, and we think as we sit here today that that was a reasonable. Uh, choice and, and at least the first major decision in terms of state appropriation withholds is very consistent with where we are. And that's the reason we're not moving forward on any kind of pay reduction policy. I'm going to stop there. We're going to put the panel back up and take the slide off. And we're going to uh, answer questions uh, connected to finances. And so uh, Suzanne will, uh, will 
read the question. Uh, and then I'll either answer it or kick it to one of the folks on the panel. And so let me just ask now that all our, our panel members start their cameras and we'll begin on the uh, Q&A piece. Suzanne, do we have any budget related questions? Uh, we do. Uh, and just as a reminder, because we are not uh, going to be addressing furloughs today. We won't cover those questions in this section. If we have time afterwards, we will. Uh, so the, we really only have one question and um, it asks, is the university considering offering an early retirement option as part of its budget cutting measure? We are not. Uh, we announced that uh, uh, right after the last town hall uh, we are not doing a retirement incentive. So again, for people that are waiting to make the decision for fall, there's no incentive. So you just need to make that decision based upon your comfort level with coming back to school uh, and your, your status in Mosier's or, or CURP. We are not doing a retirement incentive for faculty or staff anytime this year final decision. Okay, the rest really have to do more with salary reduction and furlough. So I think um, we can answer those at the end. Or yeah, and, and again, let me just, I know some of those may have been rolled in early because you anticipated we'd talk about that. We're not doing furloughs. We are not doing salary reductions. So, so again, uh, I, I would just ask, uh, um, uh, Given where we are on the budget, that's not necessary. And so if it were to become necessary in January because there's an $8 million you know, withhold, if it were to become necessary because sometime during the semester we have to roll back online and our enrollment goes down significantly, kind of all the work we've done today probably has to be redone because the circumstances are changed. So again, no need to worry about pay reductions or furloughs for the coming semester. We're not going down that road. We don't have to. Okay, I think we're done with our uh, budget questions. All right, very good. We will uh, go back to uh, then topic number two, and we'll pull the, the next slide back up. Um, you all should have, uh, if, you're, if you're an employee of the university, you should have received an email from me which contained a link to our return to campus guide. Uh, we have not printed this off. It is, it, is a, it is a website document only, but you'll see it on the screen there. This went out to all students, all parents, and all employees on Monday and is posted on our webpage. You can go to the homepage and, and in either one or two clicks, get directly to this guide. 19 pages. Um, the guide addresses our overarching principles, mitigation strategies, self-monitoring requirements, cleaning procedures, circumstances when you should not come to campus, academic advising, residence hall move-in, housing and dining rules, bookstore operations, transportation, Greek life, athletics, recreation, events, etc. I would just encourage everyone to review the document. It's not going to, all sections are not going to apply, but there are lots of things in there you will want to be aware of. You know, it, it, a couple include the importance of not coming to campus when you have coronavirus symptoms or if you've tested positive for the virus or if a family member that you've been around has tested positive for the virus. Um, it addresses mass to some extent, for example, it has a requirement in there that everyone, including all of us, when we ride the bear line, you know, so if you park at Bear Park South and get on the bear line to come to come to your office, you have to wear a mask, as do all students and guests. And so there's a lot of things in there that you will want to be aware of. Decisions on some things are still being made and we will issue a final version of the guide to returning to campus no later than August 9th. That's a week before classes start. We have not set our overall masking policy for the fall yet, but the task force working on this has delivered me two options, which I will share to you today. 
They were summarized in my cliff note on Tuesday. Again, I hope everybody reads Inside Missouri State every week. Um, but, but the two options that we're going to talk about today were summarized in a cliff note on Tuesday. Here's the uh, brave group of folks who have been working on the masking task force. I want to thank all of them for their really good work on a very hard issue and frankly an issue that has continued to evolve even uh, since they uh, presented their options uh, to me. So the most important principle behind a masking policy is protecting the health and safety of our employees, as well as the handful of students who may be more susceptible to developing life-threatening symptoms from the coronavirus. The second most important principle is the enforceability of whatever policy we adopt. The importance of this principle was reinforced at our last Board of Governors meeting. Um, if the policy we propose to the board is unenforceable, the board is not going to approve it. If the policy we adopt is unenforceable, the policy becomes mere guidance, and I fear the result would be fewer people wearing masks on campus. Um, I was at a uh, Council on Public Higher Education virtual, virtual meeting about a month ago. Uh, with all the, the university presidents and, and leadership group of, 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 uh, uh, of the four-year schools and State Tech. And State Tech went back to in-person classes in the summer. And their, uh, their chancellor, um, Sean Strong, who was here for several years as a department head, um, shared their experience that they came back with a, a policy that you had to wear masks essentially everywhere. And literally with, by the end of the first week, because that policy was unenforceable, it had essentially disintegrated to nobody enforcing masking anywhere. And, and that can't be our result. And so um, as we focus on, on these two principles, uh, here are what I believe our best two options are for the fall. Again, if you read uh, uh, my cliff note on Tuesday, these should not be a surprise to you. Uh, option one provides that masks will be worn inside all classrooms by everyone. The University of Missouri at Columbia has adopted this kind of policy. Now, since they adopted that policy, the city of Columbia adopted a mask ordinance on Monday. The order carved out the university, leaving uh, the University of Missouri free to adopt its own policy, and this is what uh, they have chosen. Option uh, two is more expansive. It requires that masks be worn um, in all academic buildings, and in all classrooms of non-academic buildings. So for example, Glass Hall, uh, Temple Hall, those are academic buildings. And so as soon as you walk in the door under this policy, you would be expected to have a mask on no matter where you are in the building. Carrington uh, uh, Hall is not an academic building. However, as you all know, on the second floor, we have a large uh, classroom. And so under option two, while you would not have to put on a mask to walk inside of Carrington, you would have to wear a mask to go into the classroom uh, on the second floor. Uh, under either option, mask would be also be required to be worn in labs, testing centers, and as I said earlier, on the bear line and in other designated spaces. Under either option, uh, Offices are allowed to determine their own masking policy. So for example, the Dean of Students Office, the Student Engagement Office are in Plaster Student Union. That's not an academic building. However, those offices could require masking within their spaces. Uh, the Provost Office, the President's Office, the Financial Aid Office, the Bursar's Office in Carrington, could also require masks to be worn in those spaces uh, under either option. 
And then of course, in your personal offices, you are allowed to choose, do you wear or not wear a mask? Do you require others to wear a mask or not? Um, I prefer option two. That's what I'm, where I am today. Um, if we believe it's enforceable because it provides more protection for our employees. If we don't have the will or ability to enforce option two, however, we might be better off with option one, which is more easily enforceable, even if it provides less protection. A couple other things before we get your thoughts. Uh, the university has obtained 70,000 masks, which we have begun distributing and which we will distribute to students in the fall at no charge. And then the next part I think is very important. For, for either of or any other masking uh, policy to work, we have to have a robust communication strategy to students, which has already begun. Um, we all and we all have to insist that everyone wear masks where they're required, particularly during the beginning of school. We don't want our policies to disintegrate into guidelines. And we have to have masks available for those who come to class or to buildings or to offices without one. And then we all have to model this behavior, including me. And then finally, we have to have consequences for the failure to comply with this policy. As I said, I'm very interested to your thoughts on this. And so, I want to poll this uh, topic and I want to poll it separately for faculty and then poll it separately for staff. For those of you in the administrator category, um, if you're an academic administrator, vote on the faculty poll. If you're uh, not an academic administrator, if you're Matt Morris and you're or Steve Focard or vice president with, without academic credentials, vote on the staff uh, side. If you are not a university employee, please do not vote. Again, you are free to email me your thoughts and I will read them and respond. And so Andrea, let's do our first poll. And so this is the staff question. So for staff members only, which masking option do you prefer? Uh, masks are required to be worn during academic classes and in limited other areas. That's option one. The second choice is option two, academic buildings and other areas. Option three is uh, uh, no requirement anywhere, but uh, recommending use without enforcement. That was the University of Georgia policy until about two days ago when they rescinded it. And then you can check, I don't like any of these options. So staff, vote now. We're gonna go about 30 more seconds and then we'll look at the results. Fifteen seconds. Okay, uh, we have a super majority there under option two uh, from staff. Very good. Let's move to the faculty question. Same options. Hold on, we're working on it. Here we are, faculty, same options. Option one, option two, recommended use only, none of the above. All right, we'll do about 30 more seconds and then we'll uh, take a look at results here.
10 more seconds. All right, Andrea, let's show uh, poll results here. Again, even a uh, stronger supermajority there. 82% uh, in favor of uh, option two. Very good. Thank you uh, again for uh, this input is very important uh, to me and I know it's important to board members and I know we have several board members watching uh, this uh, event today. Um, so now uh, if students are going to be required to wear masks in classes particularly, um, faculty are going to be on the front lines of enforcement. And so we want to know, uh, I want to know, how you feel about that. So this next question is for faculty only. Uh, Andrea, let's pull that up. And so uh, the question is, faculty, instructors, how do you feel about the prospect of enforcing masking in your classroom? First choice, I am currently capable of enforcing masking in my classroom without administrative support with administrative support. Sorry about that, with administrative. In other words, your dean's got your back. The provost's got your back. I've got your back. Second, I'm not comfortable with the responsibility of enforcement now, but I'm hopeful that guidelines, training, and signage will make it possible for me to do so. So in other words, I want to enforce this, and, but, but I need help, and we'll, we'll provide that. Third, I'm not comfortable with this responsibility and expect others to do it. And then finally, I don't believe in this policy and do not plan to enforce it. So again, faculty only, please vote on those four choices. We'll give you about 60 seconds. Thirty seconds. All right, ten seconds. And Andrea, let's go ahead and pull up the results here. Okay, good, good, good answer uh, on, um, uh, good. That, that's 92% of the people that believe that with help uh, and support, we can enforce this in our academic buildings and classrooms. And, and we will be working to provide that support and uh, I will tell you that your deans, your department heads, the provost and I are personally committed to enforcing this masking policy, um, including allowing you to uh, withdraw people involuntarily from your classes if they refuse to wear a mask. Uh, good, all right, we've got uh, one more question. This is also a faculty question. Um, if you are in a class, and let's now presume all the students are gonna be masked because that's, that's the road we're on. And you can be more than six feet away from, from the nearest students, typically the front row of students. You could, as a, an instructor, have the option of not wearing a mask, but instead wear a face shield. It doesn't provide as much protection as a mask, but could allow better communication. Of course, you could always wear a mask and a face shield. That's what the doctors are doing over at uh, Majors Health and Wellness Center. Um, and so we want to get your uh, input on this last question. Andrea, if you could pull that up. Again, this is a faculty question only. If it were made available to you at no cost, in other words, we would buy them for you, would you wear a face shield while lecturing in addition to or instead of a mask. So I don't want to buy a thousand of these if we only need 300. And so that's the, 
that's the sense uh, of the question. And so again, faculty members, please weigh in on whether you would be interested in wearing a face shield instead of or in addition to a mask during class. We'll take about 30 seconds for this. This is a yes or no easy question. Ten seconds and we'll uh, show the results of this. I see we've got over 1,200 people on the call. I really do appreciate uh, the attendance. The, the significant attendance is very helpful in, uh, in figuring out policies and where we need to be. So thank you very much for participating today. I also see we've got 130 some odd questions in the Q&A and so uh, uh, we'll start working through those here shortly. Okay, Andrea, let's, uh, let's show the results here. Uh, okay, about 76% are interested in that option. That's interesting, that, uh, but very helpful. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, I know we have already ordered, I think 300 uh, uh, fa uh, face mask or face shields. And so uh, David Hall, it sounds like we need to get about 500 more. So uh, we'll get on that uh, right away. Okay, final thing uh, before we open it up for the questions is I wanna talk about uh, timeline. Uh, timeline for a uh, final decision on the mask policy is the Board of Governors meeting on August the 6th. And, and, and you may ask, uh, uh, why? Are, why? why, why I know I, I've been beat up a little bit on, on in some emails and on social media about my appalling failure at leadership for not having made this decision two weeks ago or four weeks ago or six weeks ago. But, but there's, some, there's some good reasons, I think, to, to be on this schedule. First, uh, our country continues to change in terms of the reach of the pandemic. Um, you know, what conditions are in Springfield today are very different than what they were two weeks ago and, and, and even more dif different than what they were four weeks ago. Uh, that's true of our region, that's true of the country. Um, and so we wanna make sure we're taking all of those circumstances and that data and the best judgment of medical experts. I was on a phone call this morning with both hospital administrators and the leadership of our, uh, of our health department to make sure I had the very latest information um, to, 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 to do this town hall meeting today. Circumstances are changing. The, 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 the finish line is moving. And, and so uh, I think it's important that, that uh, knowing the parameters that we're in, that we're going to be masked in the fall, uh, we wanna make sure that, that we're making it at the right time based on the best evidence. Second, as you all probably know, the city of Springfield is considering a masking ordinance. I expect some kind of masking ordinance to pass Monday, uh, ne uh, next week at city council. I expect it to pass unanimously. Uh, that would not have been true if they had voted on this two weeks ago. And again, some of our city council folks are getting beat up about, about waiting, but, but if they'd have voted on this two weeks ago, it would have been a 5-4 vote one way or the other. We would not have developed the consensus among council and in the community for this. The, the data is different in the last two weeks. And so again, working on a timeline of making decisions based on, on actual conditions is data, is what our city has done. And I think they're gonna get to the right place uh, on Monday. Um, we don't want to announce a university mask policy now before we know what the final version of the city ordinance is going to look like. Uh, I've seen a draft, but I guarantee you it will change between now and Monday when they vote on this. Uh, Kansas City and St. Louis currently have masking ordinances and that essentially set the policy for UMKC and UMSL. Um, their policies at those two, University of Missouri, uh, campuses are different than the University of Missouri at Columbia policy because even though Columbia passed a masking ordinance Monday, they carved out the university allowing the university to, 
to form its own policy. I believe Springfield is going to do that for us because they trust that we're gonna make the right decision for our campus community. Again, we wanna be consistent though with what we do with what the city is doing. There's value in consistency. Third, uh, the Board of Governors is the policy making arm of the university. That's their job. And the board wants and needs to be the decision maker on this very important policy for the university. Um, I'm not gonna shirk my responsibility, I promise you. I will make a very strong recommendation to the board. I will share the polling results we got today and we'll evaluate circumstances between now and the board meeting to see uh, if we need to revise uh, where we are uh, currently. I will tell you honestly, my thinking has evolved over the last two weeks. Uh, if I, um, because of pressure, had made a decision on masking two or three or four weeks ago, I can tell you I almost certainly would have chosen option one. Um, but circumstances have moved me to option two. We will continue to evaluate those circumstances, data, the decisions of communities and other universities in making our final recommendation to the board. Um, I'm glad we did not make our decision on masking when the University of Missouri did, or I think we would have had to backtrack and roll out a different masking policy. And so again, let me urge you to be patient with us we're not reluctant on making these decisions. We're not, we're not being dragged, kicking and screaming over the ever moving finish line, but we're making decisions when we need to based on what's happening in our community and in our state and in our country. And I would tell you that strategy has worked well for us so far. Um, so, we will have one more town hall meeting before the board meeting and before school starts to share final decisions and receive additional input. Uh, the details are here. It will be same, same, same bat time, same bat channel for you uh, that know that reference, 10 o'clock on August the 5th, the day before our board meeting. Um, we'll do it just like this. And uh, uh, I want to, uh, so I'm done now with, uh, with my presentation and uh, I'm gonna open it up first for questions regarding the masking policy. Then we'll move to other reopening questions. And then if we have time, um, we will take questions as always on any topic. Suzanne? Okay, well, after you said that, we actually did get a number of budget questions in, so may we begin with those first? Okay. okay. Uh, what does withhold mean? So uh, what that means is uh, the, uh, the state legislature passed a, uh, a budget, the governor signed it into law, and that budget for us uh, gave, appropriated us $94 million dollars. We get that one twelfth at a time over, over the 12 month period of the fiscal year, which begins July 1 and ends June 30th. The governor has decided that of that $94 million, he has withheld and is not right now going to allow us to draw down $12 million of that. So we went from 94 to $82 million uh, in change. Um, in theory, if revenue improves, and, and, and the governor does that because he's constitutionally required to, 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 to operate under a balanced budget, and he's essentially saying, I think the legislature's passed a budget that requires me to spend more than the revenue is going to support. And so he did about $500 million of withholding, and 12 million of that came from Missouri State University's budget line. And so if revenue comes in better, then he expects that we might be able to get some more, some of the money that was withheld later in the fiscal year. On the other hand, if money comes in, if revenue comes in 
um, less than he expects, that's how we could get a second withholding um, uh, at, the, at some time during the year. And so uh, as a reminder of the, our operating budget, about 97% of it comes from two, two sources, enrollment, state appropriations. State appropriations, about 36%. And so, uh, so, so, you know, losing a big chunk of state appropriations is, is, is um, significant to us. That's between tuition fees and state appropriations. 70% of that goes to funding uh, the salaries and benefits of our employees. Okay, thank you. What do the reductions in academic equipment and classroom repair entail? So uh, we have uh, on the uh, classroom uh, and maintenance and repair budgets, as well as Frank's equipment budget, we have reduced those budgets by 75%. So for example, uh, I think Frank's equipment budget had a half million dollars in it. It now has $125,000 in it. So that means Frank has less money to spend on new equipment. Uh, classroom upgrades went from, I think, a million one hundred thousand dollars to two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. So we have less money to to spend on that. Um, in urgent kind of situations, we still do have university reserves that we could put into that. Uh, if we get federal money through the Gear Fund, I would expect to move a good piece of that money into those kinds of budgets. So, so again, we'll see how that plays out, but just know those budgets have smaller amounts of money for the whole year in them. Thank you. Uh, how will graduate assistantships be affected? Um, I, I, Frank, I'm gonna turn that one over to you. And again, this is a good time for me to remind everybody if you're on the panel to start your camera. But Frank, please, would you take the graduate assistant question? Yes. Um, at this time, graduate assistantships have uh, not had any uh, centrally directed cuts made to them, and uh, we do not anticipate at this time they will. Most of the graduate assistantships that are in academic units have already been hired or committed for this fall and I suspect that's also true in the non-academic units as well. Um, some of those will be only for the fall semester and there would be a new hiring process for the spring semester. I don't know what that percentage distribution is right now, but if things really got more severe, then that spring semester would be looked at as one of the many, many places we would have to realize whether we wanted an economy through that. But right now, uh, our assistantships have not been affected. And Frank, I have a few more questions that I think would be yours to answer. Uh, given the budget, will the professor salary incentive program continue? Right now, we're planning for it too. There's a lot of time between now and uh, next spring. As you know, we did five of those this year and we kept that commitment. That's probably what we would project, but um, there's a lot of unknowns yet to come before I want to make a final statement on that. Thank you. Will academic positions be searched this coming year or do we anticipate that the budget requires a freeze? So I'm going to jump in on uh, that one. Um, what, what we are going to, to do on most uh, academic positions is that uh, we're going to wait to see what our enrollment numbers look like in the fall. We've got uh, 68 positions currently frozen for the year, half of which are academic, half of which are non-academic. Uh, those will stay frozen for the year. Doesn't mean we will, we will not search for them, but we will not fill them for the current year. Uh, and then we've had about 30 more retirements in the last uh, two months. And so um, uh, Frank and I uh, are meeting with Steve next week to determine which are both necessary and capable of being filled with say a visiting professor, a local instructor for the next year. 
And then uh, after we see enrollment data, uh, census data four weeks into the semester, then Frank and Steve Folkhart, our CFO, and I will meet together and determine um, how many of those positions as well as the new positions we can open up for hiring. So, so no decision on that yet. We think there will be academic hiring for next year, but again, we, we don't want to, to put the cart in front of the horse on this. Frank, uh, other thoughts on that? No, I believe you've outlined it, uh, what we've agreed to. Uh, remember that those positions that Cliff has referred to as frozen for next year are how we are making the budget reduction. Uh, a major portion of it is coming from that money for next year is, uh, is not being spent. And that's where some of the budget that was approved is coming from. Okay. How do the budget reductions affect student scholarships and research funding for faculty and students? So on the, on the scholarship side, there's no, been no change to scholarships. Frank, you take the research part. Well, some of the equipment funds that will no longer be distributed out to the colleges had multiple uses. Research and classroom uses were the common norm for most of those. So some of those upgrades that would have been used in uh, cutting edge research will not be available uh, for the upgrade for next year, um, but they do not have a direct effect on, uh, we're not cutting anything in the uh, research um, grant budget, which is uh, internal and that I don't have the exact number, but it's around 130 or $40,000 and that will remain. We will be cutting the uh, research travel, which was for presentations, because all travel was cut, and that included that budget as well. And uh, we will not be cutting the summer fellowships uh, that have been an ongoing process for the last 30 years, at this time anyway. Those have not yet been cut. Okay. Uh, the university has canceled the online stipend for online students. Does the university consider returning that online stipend per student later on in spring 2021? I think it seems very unlikely. I think that we're in a, a at least two and probably three year uh, economic um, challenging period of time. And I, I think uh, rather than go back to that, which, which was established probably 12, 15 years ago as an incentive to, to a, a, as we developed online classes, I think we would work to put new money into uh, compensation generally uh, for our employees. Okay. And finally on budgets, will the university consider suspending programs like athletics to cut costs? We, uh, we are not going to suspend our athletic programs uh, unless the NCAA uh, determines that sports can't occur. Now, you should not think that athletics is not uh, reducing their expenditures and reducing budgets. They are. Uh, they're involved in working to reduce their budgets by uh, somewhere in the nature of a million dollars. They've also reduced uh, travel and reduced personnel uh, and are reducing supplies and have reduced scholarships and have held positions open. So they're doing the very same thing that every, every uh, division and unit uh, in the university is doing. Okay, thank you. Now we are moving on to masks. Okay. <clears throat> Can you they please get ready? <laughs> we're on speed. This is not speed round. Just for um, everyone out there, we're up to 200 questions. I do have a group that's working to aggregate them for me into different topics. So um, hopefully we'll get most of them covered. Uh, can, can you please define masks? MU, for example, wants faculty and shields, not masks. So, so I, I'm going to let David define masks. I, I will tell you um, there, there's, there's lots of evidence out there that a shield is not as effective as a mask. It just isn't. Uh, D David, you might talk a little bit about that and then talk about kind of what our masking, uh, 
what, what we're considering a mask and, and the kinds of masks that we've been able to, to uh, obtain. Yeah, and obviously CDC has different types of masks that they've identified. What we're really talking about is face coverings. So this would be the cloth type face coverings, not necessarily the surgical or certainly not the N95, which we wanna say for our healthcare um, providers that they can use those. So um, it's in, on the CDC website, it provides guidance on that. They uh, typically recommend that they be at least three ply. They even provide designs on how you can construct those. Uh, but that's what we're looking for is, uh, is it's really related to the face um, cloth type coverings whenever we're talking about masking. And anything on shields that you would share, David? Yeah, yeah. Whenever we look at shields, there's lots of evidence out there and research that's been going on that obviously the highest level of protection is to be wearing a uh, face covering. So the cloth face covering along with a shield um, or actually goggles is even safer than that. Shields are the next one down along with the face covering. Then it's if you just have a shield, um, it it's not as much protection as just having a face um, covering. And uh, the reason is, is because it's primarily spread through heavy droplets. And so the face covering actually catches that. If you're wearing a shield, then if you sneeze or cough or as you're speaking, then it still flows out and around and down it. Now it's better than not wearing anything, but that's really the reason where we looked at um, having it is, uh, you know, our faculty would be wearing a face uh, covering during it. However, if you're able to maintain six foot social distancing from the front row of students, then the mask or the uh, face shield would be an option in lieu of, because at least there we have the space as well. Will face shields be provided for staff? Yeah, um, oh, oh, on staff. Um, what we're currently um, assessing what we're going to do with face shields as far as what all of that policy is. I also noticed that there's a lot of questions regarding, um, you know, the actual enforcement and procedures and things like that regarding the masking policy. We're still working with that group in order to be able to finalize some of those. We, we've, um, you know, just kind of finished up the recommendation in order to get those turned in. And now we're continuing to work on those other questions such as the shielding um, and everything related to that. It's, it's really, um, you know, it's, it, uh, we're providing the face mask. So except in extenuating circumstances, my guess is it's probably not the case. One thing I also see is um, if, again, assuming that they're able to maintain the social distancing, we are putting up the uh, plexiglass shielding in many locations between our staff and others where they have that closer type contact uh, areas. So, you know, that's what serves in lieu of re uh, requiring a mask. Certainly, if somebody wanted to, they've got uh, that ability uh, to, to be able to, to wear protective. And certainly on, and again, I see lots of questions related to uh, masking and what about those um, with, um, um, you know, hearing loss, difficulty hearing, or, or those that need accommodation. Uh, it's, we've got an accommodation procedure where that you can make requests for that. Uh, and that goes through our normal process uh, in making those accommodation requests. Okay, thank you. Um, why is comprehensive masking in all buildings, in all indoor spaces, other than private dorm rooms, active eating spaces, not one of the options? You know, the, 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 it's the second principle of enforceability. Uh, I, I think it would be virtually impossible to enforce um, wearing a mask in dining halls, in residence halls, in the Plaster Student Union, um, in wh where there's lots of student gathering, uh, when um, uh, in uh, in the rec center. Uh, I mean, I, I just think it's 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 not an enforceable policy. And if we had that kind of policy, um, I think it then becomes less likely and harder to enforce policy and of masking in those areas where, where it really is essential. Um, and and that's, that's the bottom line. It goes back to the two principles. We're trying to get the most mask use um, uh, that can be enforced so it doesn't disintegrate into just guidelines. 
Okay, thank you. The instructions with the masks distributed to campus this week says that they can be washed up to 15 times. That would be about six weeks worth for regular daily use. Will they be replaced at some point by the university? I'll take Great question. I, you know, go ahead, David. Yeah, I was just going to say is um, that is the, the number of masks that we have available on that. Um, so I've uh, I, I'm I'm not I ha I haven't looked at those instructions. I'll look into that a little bit further. I, I wasn't aware of that, um, but let me check on that and see. But you know, I know we're distributing all of the face coverings that we have available. That those are currently being allocated out on that. Yeah, you know, the other thing I <clears throat> I would say is ma masks are not free. Uh, we, you know, we, we can regularly try to get more and provide them. Um, you know, we uh, just in checking in terms of so far, in terms of extra cleaning, uh, masking, fumigating machines, uh, a whole slew of things. We've spent over $300,000 already and school hasn't even started. And so just uh, again, um, Price is not the determining factor, but, but in, a, in an era of scarcity, we're, we're gonna be careful uh, in terms of, of how, how much of anything we buy. We don't wanna end up with stockpiles of things we don't use. Uh, but yeah, obviously uh, we want to have a, 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 a generous supply of masks on hand when we start school. Uh, and then we, if we need to obtain additional ones, we will do so. I just got some additional information on that. That was that was for the surgical style masks. So we're not distributing primarily surgical style masks. We're reserving those for students who have to go and do like clinicals in hospitals and healthcare settings. So we've got that supply that we've provided to those. The others are the cloth face coverings. They do not have that requirement. That's why I was kind of surprised and it caught me off guard, uh, but that's not the, re uh, the recommendation or the requirement on the cloth face coverings. Okay, thank you. Um, Cliff, this kind of goes back to your enforcement question. Who will have the authority or will be enforcing option two in masking? Will there be a patrol of persons reminding students and others to put their mask on? Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think this is all our jobs, right? I, I envision, and again, we'll have, uh, we're going to have some, uh, um, Dr. Einhell is doing a uh, uh, ALC retreat, provost retreat um, next week. And we'll have uh, we'll have conversations about that. You know, for example, I can envision people being outside of academic buildings on every day uh, of the first week of classes, reminding people, giving masks away. I would expect deans and department heads to be asked to participate in that, right? Because you bring some gravitas to to that situation. Faculty members are going to be expected to in, enforce it in their classrooms. I think all of us, as we are in academic buildings, uh, I think it's perfectly appropriate for me, for, for any of you to say in a very nice way, uh, uh, this is an area that requires use of masks. Please put your mask on. Uh, and I think we're just gonna have to model that uh, and enforce that. I think we're gonna want to, to have students uh, engaged in that as well. Dee, any thoughts on, the, on kind of help we might could get on the student side? Well, I would imagine we'd have a number of student leaders that would be happy to help out. We just need to work out the logistics, certainly. So, so now that we know we're going in this direction, uh, I mean, I think those are the things that the, the, the execution of the policy are the things that we really begin focusing on uh, in the next six weeks. Okay, I, I like this question. Will we have bear wear masks available at any point? And will there be an opportunity to purchase a high quality face mask? Dee? Um, I, I can address that. Yes, I purchased 12,000 uh, bear wear masks, which we are distributing to students and their parents when they come to soar and move into the residence halls. We also have some available at the Welcome Center when people visit the campus. The bookstore additionally has purchased masks that are for sale. So if a student or an employee doesn't get a bear wear mask uh, through one of the many ways we're handing them out, you can buy one at the bookstore. 
And okay, thank you. And Cliff, this kind of again goes back to the enforcement, just to clarify a little bit. How do you foresee handling the inevitable disagreements that will happen over masking? Yeah. Uh, great, great question. Uh, I mean, ultimately, uh, if, if something became really heated, I, I think it would be appropriate to call uh, security uh, to help you in those kinds of things. Uh, ultimately, um, um, I don't know, Matt, I'm going to kick this one over to you and or David to <laughs> talk about it. it. Guys, this is the hardest thing. This is the hardest piece of this. It is Absolutely easy for me to say everybody's got to wear a mask 24 hours a day on campus everywhere. Um, the, the hard part is the enforcement piece. Matt, thoughts you have on this? I know your team's been working on this. Yeah, and we will continue after hearing the feedback today, but certainly that dispatch number everyone knows. And if you have a new Bear Pass card, uh, it's on there at 836 5509. That is dispatch. And so we would ask that certainly that could be a contact made. Um, people are used to that. If they see someone skateboarding on campus, uh, they call that number and then we would have officers respond to help with the situation at hand. And, and so hopefully we'll, we'll <clears throat> I, I, I think the tone in which we all interact with people, our own employees and, and, and students and parents is going to be really important. Um, I think there's going to be peer pressure. You know, if there's only one or two people not wearing a mask in your class, I, 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 I think it's appropriate to say, you know, hey, for the protection of everyone in the room, please, please put your mask on, Mr. Smith. Um, and ultimately, we can't start class until your mask is on. Uh, are appropriate ways to do that. I mean, again, we'll be reinforcing it outside academic buildings for the beginning of classes. Um, and we'll have a communication program on this. We're already talking to uh, D and I meet with every SOAR class. We've divided them in half. We talk about masks from day one. We give them masks. I talk about the importance of wearing it in classrooms, on bear lines, in offices. You're doing it to protect other people. I talk about our, our, our team uh, that is uh, more susceptible than students to to having bad results if they contract the virus. We'll, we'll widely be communicating it on social media. We'll widely be talking about it in residence halls that first week before classes start. So, so we've, it, 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 you know, it, it's not gonna be effective if, if it's a ticket writing strategy. It's gotta be effective that it's the culture of the university. It's why it's important that you wear masks in class as well or at least the, the shield if, you, if, if, if the mask doesn't work for delivering a lecture. It, it's one of those things we're gonna to have to convey we're all in this together. Okay, thank you. Um, how does uh, option two address student safety in dorms and food service areas? It does not. What if a student claims a medical exemption, how will that, or you know, if they are given an accommodation, will they have paperwork that they can display? What, what will be the, how will they be able to respond legitimately if they are challenged? So, so I presume that's a, a student who receives a, the ability to not wear a face mask because of a particular disability Rachel, how would, uh, how would that work? How would they be, they be able to convey to people that they're not just flouting the rule? And, and not just students, but any employee as well. Or employees, sure, okay. Yeah, so uh, there are two separate accommodation processes, one for students that is uh, overseen through our Disability Resource Center. Uh, the second uh, is uh, overseen by our uh, Deputy Compliance Officer, Julia Holmes, uh, and, and under either of those processes, it's an interactive process to determine if there is an underlying disability, not uh, a personal, moral, or political objection, but an underlying disability that uh, means that mask wearing is uh, unsafe as determined by medical professionals. And then written accommodations uh, are provided and shared in the case of employees with supervisors 
in the case of students uh, given to the students so that they can share same with um, with their faculty members. Uh, it's a complicated question because uh, you have to look at what is a reasonable accommodation, not simply what's a requested accommodation. And, and frankly, in some cases, requesting an accommodation that you not wear a mask will not be reasonable because you may jeopardize the health of other people. We know primarily from scientific and medical evidence that I wear a mask to protect you, you wear a mask to protect me. So in some cases, um, that may not be a reasonable accommodation and we may have to look at other options. So would they are, get some kind of documentation though Rachel, right, for that? That's the Correct, as I indicated under either situation, they get an accommodations letter, whether it's a student who has it, who then uh, the DRC does not provide that to the faculty members, the student has it and has to affirmatively provide it to faculty members in the same case with employees, uh, it is available and provided to their supervisors. Okay. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, for some of our hearing impaired students, they usually read lips with the use of face mat of the mask. How will they be able to continue understanding uh, what has been the discussion for those, um, you know, for that situation? Rachel, back to you. Yeah. So, so that has been part of, of the discussion. Uh, the Missouri Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing actually provides clear masks free at char of charge. You can go to their website right now and request up to five masks be sent to you. So in those situations, I would anticipate that we would be working with faculty members uh, to try to um, provide them either with a clear mask. This is not a face shield. It's a clear mask um, with just a transparent panel and or with a, a face shield so that we could ensure that they are effectively communicating to those students. Uh, it seems to me that shared responsibility makes sense. So can you articulate the manner in which you've involved students in the conversation around masks? So uh, Tara Orr, uh, who is our uh, SGA president for next year, has been on the masking task force. And then we have engaged uh, the uh, SOAR leaders uh, in terms of expectations, and I think there are 50 of those. Uh, frankly, we need to, to spread beyond uh, those groups. And so, Dee, any thoughts you would uh, share in that regard? There, there will be a number of conversations as students begin to return. The resident assistants, of course, are another group that will be uh, very instrumental in helping to encourage people to wear masks and understand the policy. So we'll be working with student leaders as they return to campus to get them to help spread the word. Okay, thank you. Is there a plan to educate individuals on properly wearing masks and on enforcement of wearing masks correctly? So I think we see people with them down here, up here, you know, so <clears throat> David, I believe, are we, is that part of the video that we're preparing? Yeah, David, you want to talk about kind of the training videos that Karen's working on? Yeah, we've got uh, three training video that are just getting ready to be released. Uh, we actually have for the Springfield and the West Plains campus. Uh, one of them is really focused for students, which will be a very uh, to the point video that talks about each of those and about how to correctly wear a face covering. One is also focused for our employees, which provides, it's a little bit longer, it's like four minutes long, provides a little bit more information, and it covers a wide variety of topics. Face coverage is one of those that also provides links to resources on how to get there to understand how to properly wear them if you want to make your own, how to do that. And then the last one is for supervisors, which gives even additional information, how do you deal with, um, you know, whenever you have an employee comes and uh, indicates that, uh, you know, they've, they've tested positive or a family member tested positive. So uh, it gives guidance on those. So those will be uh, released very soon. And then we'll have additional follow-up information to go with those. Okay, thank you. Uh, and this, this next question, I think, kind of goes back to documentation. But what happens when an individual enters an office or classroom without a mask and claims they have health problems that prevent them from wearing a mask? <clears throat> So again, as we said, I think the, that the person in the office would say, hey, a mask is required here. And then it, the onus would then be on the other person to say, I have an accommodation and here it is. And then we'd figure out how to provide the service in that situation. 
Okay. Uh, the next one is, um, if we enforce masks, what does the task force think about requiring masks for students participating in a physical fitness type class that requires heavy cardiovascular activities? This also seems very dangerous. Yeah, so Dee, I know, I know at the Foster Rec Center, we've already decided that, that that's a bad idea to require masking uh, while people are working out. I presume the same thing would be in classes. Uh, Dee, Frank, thoughts on that? Certainly we haven't had that discussion, but we have had uh, preliminary discussions that there are exceptions under certain situations that likely would be one of those which should be decided in advance, you know, what would be. Doesn't mean actually though that, uh, you know, you, you will have classes where you have a half hour that they're not working out and then go to a workout mode. So each one's gonna get individualized a little bit when those circumstances are presented. You know, one of the things I would say is we, we have, we have real, Frank and I have confidence in our departments and divisions to figure out kind of how the general policies apply specifically to each area, right? And so we don't want to micromanage from central, you know, a, an exception for this class, but no exception for this class, but for this office is this, and for this office it's something else. So our thought is that we set, you know, university-wide policies and, and then and then really over the next six weeks and we're going to begin talking about this monday at administrative council david huff brought this up for example is okay under the umbrella of the university policies how's that going to work for the college of education inside hill hall and and, and so we want to empower our leadership to figure out within the parameters we set how to manage these issues within your own department and so, you know, at that kind of question, hey, I, I, I'm, doing a, uh, I'm doing an archery class and, and, and it doesn't make sense for, for our people to wear masks. Well, okay. But, but, you know, the faculty member working with that department head and the dean, you all will we'll trust you all to figure out within these parameters what the best decisions are. Okay. Um, oh, no, I lost the question. I'll get back to that one. Um, is there any requirements for the masks that are used by faculty? In other words, can they wear a mask of their own choice? Um, will mask with filters be provided? Will the mask be provided to faculty? So it's kind of an all in one. So, so we are gonna provide masks. You are free to wear your own mask. Please do not wear a mask with profanity that somehow mentions the President of the United States. That would be problematic. You, you would get, we would get calls about that. Uh, so, I mean, assuming the mask is appropriate, you can wear whatever mask uh, you desire, but we will provide masks free of charge. Okay. Uh, why poll people's opinions? Shouldn't you do what is best and not popular? Um, yeah, I, I, I think we should always do what is best. Um, but, but I think, um, uh, and so, I mean, here's, here's the honest to God reality though. Um, I, I need to know what our community is thinking on things. Again, it goes back to enforceability. If, if, if 90% if of the people on this call had essential of uh, faculty had said, I'm not going to enforce this in my classroom. Well, I think we'd be going back looking at a different kind of policy. Right. And so I do think it's important. Um, you're not the decider on this. Our board of governors is the decider on this, but, but they would ask, what do our faculty think of the, of the policies? What, what are the staff, what's the staff input been on this? It is one factor that ought to go into the equation. It is certainly, uh, I, I think building consensus around a policy helps us carry it off successfully and enforce it. And so um, uh, I, I have never thought of myself, I know Frank doesn't either, as we just decide and, and, and that's the way it is. Uh, lots of times people have real important input that, that 
changes, a, at least a nuance, a detail of a policy. We learn from these town halls. Uh, we learn where we have gaps that we need to work on. I mean, there's information that comes forward. Um, and, and so it's important what our city's doing. It's important what our state's doing. It, it's important what other universities in town are doing. It's important what the University of Missouri and the University of Arkansas are doing. It's important what, what the health data is for Springfield and Southwest Missouri. It's important what, what our community um, students, faculty and staff think. And so, so I don't know, I, I think it's important that we, that, we, that we gather all that information and then it's my job uh, to recommend to the board what the best policy is. And I'm not sure can that responsibility by, by getting your input. I hope, I hope people don't think that. Okay. Um, our, do, are faculty expected to lecture with a mask on? Would it make a difference if there were plexiglass in place? What is that expectation? So uh, a plexiglass on the, on the podium in a classroom is not an effective strategy to protect you or the students. And so um, I think we're in one of two situations. I think it's you can lecture with a mask or a mask and a shield together. Or if there's room for you to stand back, you can lecture with a shield only without a mask. I would advise you to have a mask on as people come in classes, to put a mask on as they leave because you're likely to have closer interaction with people. But, I, but, but if the physical logistics of the room allow, you can wear a face shield instead of a mask. Okay. To what extent will Missouri State be able to follow the CDC's recommendation to space students at least six feet apart in classes? I ask this because UNC recently announced a policy of three feet with masks, but quickly changed it to six feet after public criticism from parents and faculty. So the, the reality of uh, the number of uh, faculty we have and the physical space that we have does not allow us to keep people spaced six feet apart. Um, it just doesn't. And so, uh, hence the importance of the masking requirement with optional face shields. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go to some other questions. Well, here's one. Hallways and elevators are packed in buildings between classes. How would option one be able to address this issue? Yeah, I think we would sign elevators as other areas where people would be expected to wear masks. Again, I anticipate we'll be at option two. Uh, we, we, we may be even be more aggressive than option two, depending upon circumstances over the next four weeks. But uh, elevators would be one of those other designated areas under either op under any option where masking would be required. And then people on the elevator would would be primarily responsible for making sure others are wearing their masks. What about masks in the library? I know there are areas in the library where we're expecting students to wear masks. I frankly think we will likely reevaluate. Uh, library requirements as we see how the virus progresses over the next six weeks. We have vendors selling food in many of the academic buildings. How does the enforcement requirement work in those situations? So we, uh, vendors are the most easily enforced because if they refuse to comply, they are told to leave. And so um, there, there will absolutely be a vendor masking requirement uh, in all academic buildings. Uh, Chartwells is developing their, their own national standards. I certainly expect to see everyone working uh, under the Chartwells umbrella to be wearing a mask while they are uh, working in food service. Is that correct, Dee? And what about the people who are eating? Last time I checked, you can't wear a mask and eat. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, you know, and so, so if you're worried about that, um, I would not eat uh, in, in the dining halls or in the PSU. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm going to bring a lunch from home. 
So again, I, I mean, we just all going to have to, to make our own judgment uh, in terms of that because you cannot eat or drink and wear a mask. It's not possible. Uh, Cliff, ahead, I, yeah. I'm, I might add that Chartwells has been working uh, nationally to, to look at, you know, best practices to put in place. And, and they've done a lot of work in this area. They will have to go options in the dining facility. So you could still pick up your meal if you're a student in one of the dining halls or in the retail areas and then go eat outside or go back to your residence hall room or your office. So th those things are being considered and thought through very carefully. Yeah, good. Great, great addition, Dee. Thank you for that. Yeah, there are absolutely be to go options for students and faculty. Again, one of the things they're doing is you're not going to be able to pay for, with cash anymore. You're going to have to charge it. Uh, again, that keeps people from touching the same money. And uh, so again, just working through all of those kinds of things now. Okay. Um, Rachel, does enforcing a mask infringe on my rights? <laughs> um, at the risk of sounding too glib, does requiring you to wear pants enforce, uh, infringe upon your rights? Legally, we are um, able to both implement a reasonable dress code and to take reasonable safety precautions. We have very recent guidance from the EEOC supporting our uh, enforcement of masks. There is no legal right not to wear a mask in a pandemic if required by your employer or educator. Yeah. So if you are in the camp that says, I'm not gonna wear a mask, this is probably not the place you should be employed. How will FERPA be complied with if a student is authorized not to wear a mask, that student will stand out in the classroom. Rachel? Yeah, so I, I can take that. Um, there is simply no way um, for, there would not be an announcement indicating that a student had a disability. However, by virtue of a fact that a student would be in a classroom with, without wearing a mask, inferences will be drawn. That's, that's simply unavoidable. Yeah, and, and you know, maybe there's an opportunity to engage with that student and get his or her permission to let the, let the class know the, the rationale there might actually be a, a better strategy than keeping it a secret sometimes. Will plexiglass shields be available for use in personal offices? Matt? For plexiglass, we have given ourselves a budget of $100,000. That started with category one and then category two areas. Mark Wheeler with Planning, Design and Construction has been leading that charge as one set of eyes to see where primary transactions are based, where there's high frequency, high touch point areas. And that's where we've started. So you've seen plexiglass in areas where SOAR guests have been arriving and doing transactions, that all is in place. Now there's 134 shields out there now. Some offices, yes, have been approved. Not all offices based upon, again, how much transactions. So what my guidance would be is, Mark Wheeler is Mr. Shield uh, with Planning, Design and Construction. And so if you have a need that needs to go through your chain of command, but ultimately it goes there. And I say through your chain of command as it may need to be funded by the department if it doesn't fall under that category one or two category. Uh, the only exception, of course, would be as if an accommodation is approved through the process Rachel outlined earlier. You know, and I, I would encourage everyone to begin thinking about alternate ways to do things that are not face to face. So, for example, you know, uh, for a faculty member who does office hours, um, could you schedule office hours over Zoom rather than doing them in your in your uh, office? Uh, if you do advising for a set of 50 students, could you figure out a way to do that uh, not in your office, uh, in an empty classroom, or again, uh, remotely over Zoom, or, or some other mechanism that way? So again, I think we all need to be begin kind of reevaluating how we do things to see for, for those things that, that can be done uh, remotely. I mean, that, that's a good option. 
And just from personal experience, uh, we checked out surplus, my staff did, and got some uh, wall separators for cubicles and had those installed uh, since we didn't really have a budget for plexiglass. So there is a, some cost effective ways out there as well. Uh, for departments deciding on mask requirements for their common area, does this include staff working in the common area or just students who walk in? Appreciate any guidance on this. Who wants to take that? Um, you want me to take that, Cliff? Okay. Yeah, uh, whenever we worked through that on the masking policy, it was established that uh, you know, you could designate, an office could designate, you know, kind of that common area as a um, required mask. So we would expect anyone coming in the space in order to wear that mask. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I would think if an office is designated mask required, that it applies to students, guests, parents, workers, everyone in, in, the, in that space. Unless you're in your own personal space and then, and then you know, I'm not, I'm not sitting in my, in my office with my door closed with my mask on, but when people come in, particularly if they're wearing a mask, I put one on. For those offices that have student lounges located within their office, will there be guidance on how many students will be allowed at once? You know, I, I, I think, again, this goes back to um, kind of that departments are going to have to manage their space. <clears throat> you know, I, I think we are likely, for example, to, to put signs on conference rooms or major conference rooms that you must mask if you have more than, you know, four people, six people, whatever the, whatever the, the social distancing capacity is. Uh, if you're in an academic building, then that's an area where it, you would be expected for people to wear a mask. But again, I think, I think departments need to analyze their own space uh, and contact David Hall for help in, you know, figuring out those kinds of questions. Say if we had more than four people in this, you know, if we had, how many people can we have in our student lounge before they couldn't, you know, they'd be on top of each other and they need to wear a mask. David can help you do that calculation and then you could put a, put a sign up on the door that would indicate that. Again, we're, we're going to ask departments to, to survey their own areas and, and then, put plans together to, to work through on that. Frank, anything you would add to that? No, I, I hope this discussion on Monday actually gives us that kind of freedom. For example, in the front of the provost office, that's a very small area. We have, I believe, six chairs there. Uh, we're gonna have the discussion about taking some of those chairs out to start with, because uh, if you leave them there, then you've just invited uh, more people. And uh, so that kind of discussion, I believe, ought to be with each of those areas. Okay, thank you. Will the outreach campuses be provided with masks as, as well, or are they on their own to purchase supply for staff, faculty, and students? So Lebanon, et cetera, uh, Neosho. David, are we getting, uh, are we getting, I presume we can get masks to everyone, can't we? That is correct. And, and they've been sent to West Plains as well. Okay, uh, you know, we have a lot of questions. So I'm gonna move on and uh, Cliff, I'll, I'll give you a couple of the categories and see which ones you might want to choose from. Okay, we, we got 27 minutes. I know, we have, which is why you're getting the choice here. We have testing, quarantine, I feel like this is Jeopardy, um, travel, return to campus, uh, cleaning, diversity, and visas. Well, why, why don't we, um, again, why, why don't we take those last two topics? Let's do the, the uh, um, what was the one before diversity? Oh, international students. I, you know, l l let me take the international student, um, let me make a statement on international students. Um, and then I'm gonna have Dr. Baker weigh in, and then we'll take specific questions, then we'll move to diversity. Um, and, and then guys, we will work to answer questions on re all the reopening issues um, through the Provost Communique as well as uh, uh, Cliff Notes and Inside Missouri State. Uh, again, if, if there are big, big picture questions, 
uh, you can either email those to me at the president's office and I will get them to Dr. Cisco or Dr. Ryan Hillig or Jeff Coiner or anybody else. We'll get answers to those. Uh, but but um, let, let, let me make a let me make a statement on the on the international students. Um, I was very disappointed in the um, directive that was issued from ICE this week. Um, essentially requiring that if a campus moved completely online or started completely online in the fall, that our international students could not complete their work or, or could not move to those online classes but would have to leave the country. Um, there are so many reasons that that is the wrong policy for our country. I'm not going to go into that now. Um, that, that's, uh, it's just so disappointing because I know so many of the students that are impacted. It, it makes me emotional to talk about it. And so we're going to, um, so first of all, that rule is not going to apply to us this fall because we're starting with, with seated and hybrid classes. But I worry what happens if, if you know, we have a, a, new, a new wave and a stay at home order and, and, and we have to reconsider that. And so the first thing that I would say is we will figure out a way to manage our classes to avoid sending a thousand people home all over the world in the middle of the semester. We're not gonna do it. Um, and that impacts on how we're going to deliver classes, but, but that's an important impact because that group of students is an important piece of our community. Uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a university statement out tomorrow addressing this in more detail. Uh, Jim, I know your team is working on this. You want to weigh in on, on what has happened this week? Yeah, I share President Smart's uh, concerns with this. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, really makes this very bad is that Right now, it's almost impossible for students to get air flights out of the country, even if they, even if they try to. It's very difficult. Uh, it's extraordinarily expensive, et cetera. What we are working on right now is the international programs will put out a website uh, that's got some in, uh, different information for our students. We'll be contacting or in the process of contacting uh, all of our students to talk about what their options are. There's really four categories of students that we're gonna be working with. Uh, really what this affects, <coughs> excuse me, is the F1 visas. And so we're going to really look at issuing I-20s again that really take into account the blended format. As President Smart indicated, we're in pretty good shape in the sense that we have classes on campus, uh, but we do have some distance learning. So as long as there's a blended system in place, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, during the course of this semester, we will be working on some different alternatives in case we were to go online. We could still do classes on campus if we have to that are very focused. So we'll be working on a strategy so that none of our students have to face the possibility of trying to go through three countries to get home and spending all their money that, that they don't necessarily have, and even on flights that don't exist. So. We, this, is, this is really something that we're very concerned about. We don't like it, but we will respond to it and we will take care of our students. All right, so Suzanne, what questions do we have? Okay, so the first one is, we actually just have the one and it, sorry, I've lost it in my, uh, is MSU joining Harvard and MIT to push back against uh, the federal administration's new immigration law? We, we will not be a part of the lawsuit. We don't have the money to fund that. Uh, as a public institution, it's probably not appropriate for us to fund that, but we will take care of our international students. I promise you that, period. Okay, so now, thank you. We will move on to the diversity questions. All right. Okay. Uh, 
what is in place to address the current racial tensions in our country? I know this isn't a COVID question, but it is an important issue for our students. What's in place? What programs and training and all will be in place? So uh, I'll turn it over to Wes here in a moment. Um, um, and Dr. Cisco and Frank, you, you guys be prepared to weigh in as well. I mean, we've, we've been working on uh, creating an inclusive climate at the university since, since I've been president. Uh, that, that, the, the, that runs the gamut of um, um, having guidelines for hiring so that we can create a more diverse workforce, uh, faculty pool, it includes recruitment of students, it includes scholarships, it includes uh, student support programs uh, from TRIO to Bears Lead to, to a whole slew of others. Uh, it includes uh, events and activities. It includes uh, um, uh, training uh, for faculty, staff, and students. It includes mentoring projects. It includes expansion of facilities. And so, I mean, there are literally hundreds of ways that, that I believe we have advanced the ball in the last nine years, but let's not fool ourselves. There's way more work to be done. Our black and Hispanic um, faculty and staff need white allies. They need us to do a better job. And there's an opportunity here for us to advance the ball. Um, and so, I know Wes, uh, talk for a few minutes and then we'll kick it over to both Frank and Dee to talk a little bit about your areas and, and, and either new or expanded initiatives or emphasis that we have. Wes, start us off. Okay, thank you, President Smart. Uh, part of this challenge has to do with promoting an anti-racism uh, environment. And that's not only on campus, but also in a larger community. And so, uh, we're certainly working on an action plan along with the other members of the Administrative Council to address uh, the promotion of anti-racism through our uh, revitalization and revamping of our uh, Facing Racism Institute. Uh, we're looking to provide uh, anti-racism training to our professional development for uh, administrators as well as um, academic leadership team members uh, such as our uh, uh, department heads, et cetera. Uh, there's a long list of things that we've been working on, as the president has pointed out. But the other side of the coin I'd like to uh, emphasize is the, the issue of anti-racism and racism is one that individually many of us have to come to grips with. And I sometimes think that um, uh, many of our faculty, sometimes many of our staff think, well, we got a division for diversity and inclusion, let them deal with it. But your students are being adversely uh, are impacted or traumatized by the events that are going on nationally and perhaps worldwide. And so I think it is incumbent upon all of us to develop the skill sets, the awareness, the, the knowledge, and hopefully the skill sets to assist our students and our uh, other campus stakeholders in dealing with the reality of systemic racism that has existed in this nation uh, for so long. And, and so it's incumbent upon, I, I think, as faculty members and staff members, we learn more about systemic racism. We learn more about uh, uh, what it is and it, how to mitigate its impact. And then we collaborative, we'll collaboratively work to carry out the, the, the public affairs mission that we have at this institution. I mean, part of the reason I came to Missouri State is because of its public affairs mission. And certainly over the last few years, there have been challenging moments uh, in, in our history in this nation, uh, certainly and sometimes locally. But uh, the, the emphasis on, uh, on a public affairs mission, and, and, and it just seems to me that addressing issues of systemic racism, addressing issues of uh, dis disparate um, uh, impacts, whether it's public health, whether it's social economic policy, that is something that this institution should be proudly uh, seeking to address. And so along with all the other things that we're doing on an individual uh, uh, group, uh, uh, on, in our colleges and, and with student affairs is it, simply the, I, I think, um, uh, an admonition or a challenge to continue to, uh, to grow and develop in these areas and to be champions for valuing the inclusion of, of diversity across the board. And so um, 
we will have the action plan that will be delineated. Uh, uh, part of our long range plan uh, incorporates again, diversity and inclusion, but uh, th this has been an ongoing prog uh, process. And so we'll just continue to do what we do, but it's gonna take each of us individually and collectively uh, engaged in this effort to address the issues associated with systemic racism. And I look forward to working with all of you in that capacity. We're also reviewing a variety of policies. We will shortly roll out a standardized test optional policy. Uh, we're, we're, uh, Rachel is, is going through a series of policies to evaluate, uh, uh, you know, how, how can we strengthen our bias response team as an example for that. Dee, let me turn it over to you. I know there's some things you all are working on. Yes, certainly. Um, I think Wes did a great job kind of summarizing where we are, and we're excited to be a part of those initiatives. I was going to mention the bias response team. Hopefully people know of its existence. We're working hard to find ways to enhance that so that um, people who find themselves in a situation where bias has occurred uh, find that there is a, an outcome that is helpful in terms of education and awareness. Uh, you all probably know that the students are excited about a new multicultural center. And so while that process will take some time, we're looking forward to continuing to work with students on how we can create a meaningful space for students to congregate and to hold meetings and to uh, receive services and programs. So there are a plethora of things that, uh, that we're working on. And um, so we're just excited to be a part of it. Great. Um, just to continue on that uh, uh, vein, uh, we will, in the academic side, continue with our hiring practices and try to even be more aggressive so that we hire in ways to have uh, better representation and, and opportunities of that nature. But every one of my uh, colleges has some uniquenesses in things they are planning and they have already done things but starting anew and continuing on and they range from mentoring processes for uh, new employees to the fact that uh, we now have 38 faculty participating in an institute that is a national wide institute on how do we better have inclusion practices in the classroom. And it's a 20 hour process that they're participating in, in trying, okay, how do I make my class uh, be more inclusive in all kinds of ways, the subject matter included in that. And so I don't think one can detail all of the things, but it's rather a mind changing, attitude changing process that has to occur and these initiatives only really are effective when that happens in an attitudinal way. Yeah. So, so, so we, we'll have a, a, you know, we're not, we're not going to be able to gather for our uh, faculty luncheon uh, in the ballroom this year. And so we'll be doing a, some kind of virtual event to, to welcome faculty back. You know, we do the staff event in January, but, uh, fact, we, we typically do a faculty luncheon uh, the, the week, the Thursday before school starts. Look for um, uh, a virtual activity where we will have a meaningful diversity conversation as we start the year. Chris Craig is working uh, to plan that, and I would encourage everyone to tune in for that. Um, if you haven't gone to Black at Mo State or Black at Mizzou or Black at U Arc, A R K. Those are, those are three big schools in our area. Look at all of them. We got to do better. It's just that simple. We got to do better. Suzanne? Okay. I am, uh, we just for everyone who's participating, we have over 300 questions. So we clearly aren't going to get to all of them. Right. I'm going to uh, jump a little. There are many that are faculty, very um, faculty directed. So those will go to um, Dr. Einhella Glader, but we will be addressing all of them uh, because we do, um, this is something that we can save. So I'm going to jump a little here to some of the speed answers. Um, yep. 
So, so, is, hey, so, so my, I know my friend Kishore is on this call. Kishore, type in your name. Just start the last question. Type in your name, Kishore, and then tell, and then write in whatever question specifically you want me to answer at this town hall, and we will end on your question if we can identify it. All right, Suzanne, go. Okay. Uh, is COVID testing available at Majors Health? Yes. Will we be regularly testing faculty, staff, and students for COVID in order to effectively monitor the virus? We will have a testing policy. We cannot regularly test people. There are simply not enough tests and not enough labs to do that. And so, but we do have enough tests and the lab capacity to test people that are symptomatic. We will also do some random testing. Uh, we are, for example, we have tested every student athlete that has come back to campus uh, this summer. And, and so there will be some random testing, but we don't have the ability to test people every week, just. Okay. There's no test and there's All no right. lab capacity for that. Um, it, should we refer faculty, staff, and students to majors or to a local hospital if they are exhibiting COVID type symptoms? I would start at majors. That they, they are completely prepared to manage this. They have a room a student or employee can go into that, that is airtight and, and I mean, when we design that building, we designed it for a pandemic. So I would start at majors with a phone call, not a walk-in, and they will manage it from there. Will sports be going on this fall and will take tailgating take place? No idea. We had a Missouri Valley Conference football meeting yesterday. Everything is up in the air. Uh, we expect guidance from the NCAA. And so uh, again, we can't create a, a sports policy for the fall when the governing organizations in which we play sports haven't told us what the rules are yet. So again, that's one of those things we should know by uh, August 9th. Okay, once the university opens, is the university considering communicating in a weekly basis the cases of coronavirus, sorry, coronavirus cases that arise in the university? We will have, much like the city of Springfield or Green County does, we'll have a dashboard and we will, we will update that every single day. Our commitment is we will communicate with you. We have a specific task force working on that very project right now. Has administration had any discussion regarding support for faculty and staff who are parents and have had significant disruptions to childcare schooling? For example, can the university allow parents to change cafeteria withholdings for dependent care. Rachel? I would actually defer to Matt on this, on this question. Matt? Sorry, getting off mute there. Um, certainly I would encourage anyone who has any issues with child care to contact our human resources office Cases are so, uh, everybody's at a different place and needs are so specific. They will walk you through that process. Uh, and certainly we will be nearing uh, and advertising in the fall about open enrollment, cafeteria plan elections. That will all become part of what's being announced very soon. So I think that's the best way to answer this question at this point. Thank you. How many COVID positive cases will we need to see before shutting down in-person course instructions? There are other universities that have announced a specific number that will shut things down. I don't think that's the best strategy. Uh, I don't think we can say if we have 50 cases or 100 cases that we would shut down. I, I think we will track a variety of metrics, including hospital capability, number of hospitalizations, uh, number of, of, of uh, cases, where those cases are. Uh, and so I, I'm, I, I do not anticipate we would have a regular number. Uh, another factor is, does the city or state go to a stay at home order so that people are not, can't come to classes? There are a lot of factors that would go into that decision that the, the general, the, the, kind of the analysis process will be a part of our final version of our return to school guide. 
but, but there isn't a, a magic number that would say, okay, we're, we're gonna shut down either permanently or for a shorter period of time. Uh, we're gonna have to just manage that as it occurs, tracking the data as it happens. But you should expect we will have dozens, maybe, well, let me just, let me just stop there. You should expect we would have dozens of positive coronavirus test results this fall. That, that's happening everywhere. And so we've got to figure out how we manage through those kinds of situations. I don't think we're gonna see the places shutting down all across America again, absent a just disastrous consequences. Hence, masks, plexiglass, cleaning, um, limitations of numbers, elimination of certain events. It's all these kinds of things that we're talking about that are gonna help us manage through the fall. But we've got that, we've got that on our agenda and we'll be tracking all of those uh, major metrics. And if it became unsafe for us to come to school, um, well then we'll, then we'll uh, diverge into a contingency plan. Okay, are there any medical professionals on the BOG? If not, shouldn't be Board of Governors, if not, shouldn't we be looking to the CDC and local health officials for guidance? So we do look to the CDC for guidance, uh, and we do not have uh, doc any physician uh, or healthcare worker on our board of governors. And so it becomes my responsibility in making a recommendation to the board to make sure that I'm taking into account the CDC guidance, the guidance we get from the, from the Greene County Health Department. Um, and and guidance from our own medical professionals like David Claiborne and David Maggie, who are part of a core group. Uh, David Hall researches uh, um, all of the uh, significant data that's out there. And so, so scientific and medical data goes into the, um, the, the mix, maybe the most important part of the mix in terms of making recommendations to the board in terms of what policy is, but ultimately, that's my job to make that recommendation. And the way our structure is, it's the Board of Governors job to set the ultimate policies for the university. And, and they take that responsibility very seriously. Okay, um, what will the university do to address student partying? And are we concerned about camp students that are returning to campuses and throwing COVID parties? Of course. Um, and Dee, uh, why don't you start with this one? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that uh, we will work hard to educate students on the expectations. Um, you know, our Office of Student Engagement works with all of our registered student organizations, our fraternity and sorority community, uh, student leadership in a variety of ways, and we will be trying to uh, educate them and encourage them not to do uh, COVID parties and the like. Um, so, so, uh, so find Keyshore's question, Suzanne, and that'll be our last one. But uh, um, let me just say, my major concern is for you. Um, my, my major concern is for Frank and Jim and Dee and Suzanne and people on our team uh, and all our faculty and staff um, because the likelihood is you are the ones that are more susceptible to the negative consequences of this than most of our 18 to 22 year old students. Not, not completely, but, but that's what we're gonna focus on. Um, you know, my mindset is work on the things we can control. Um, that's a big enough job. Work on the things we can control. And if we do that, then we're gonna get th through this semester um, just fine. Do we have Keyshore's question? They're getting it for me. Right. Uh, is there a plan to open the pools and foster rec anytime soon? Also, will the pool at the Hammond Student Center be open this fall? That's not Keyshore's question, but go ahead. It is not, I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting for Keyshore's question. Um, I, I can address that. Foster Rec Center reopened and they're doing so um, in phases. They've got a detailed reopening plan on their website 
and it's linked through the guide uh, to reopen campus. Uh, the pools are scheduled to open in the next few weeks as part of that gradual reopening. Okay. I, I am still, I don't see it on the la I don't see it on more recent questions asked. It just says anonymous attendees and some okay. people have their names. So that, my team is looking for it. I think some came in and they are looking for it to give to me. One more question and we'll see if they can find it. If not, we'll wrap up. Okay. Uh, well, that's kind of, let's see. Oh, I like these. Well, I, it's not whether I like them or not, but I think they're good. <laughs> I think they are helpful. Um, if an instructor is exposed to COVID or show symptoms, can they still conduct classes remotely through virtual conferencing, classroom instruction, or pivot online? Frank? I think anybody exposed is going to have a different reaction as to how sick they are. If they're not sick, then a remote operation causes no harm to anyone else. But I would not want to force somebody to say, you got to continue teaching when you're sick and actually having physical limitations that, uh, you know, would keep you from feeling up to that task. But when you're remote and you're in your own home, there is no exposure. And so a conscientious person who is asymptomatic but exposed, they can continue to teach. Yeah, I, I think we're going to have to really lean into being flexible and being able to, to switch things up so that we continue the education process. And so, again, great question. And we know the people that get this disease have, have all the way from no symptoms to on a ventilator. And, and so we just have to figure that out as, uh, as it occurs. And it will occur. Okay, Suzanne, last question. Okay, I believe that the distinguished Vice President Matt Morris said that the air ventilation on campus has been set to the recommended maximum. Is it possible to go even higher than recommended? What is that number again? Okay, Matt, last question for you. And thank you, Keyshore. And you're exactly right. We are reviewing the outdoor airflow rates in all the various buildings, our maintenance staff, our engineers working through that. We have to, any air flows, if it's a fine balance. If we pump in more outside air into the building, if we do too much, if we exceed maximum levels, then certainly that can cause other issues like high humidity in the building or could result in mold growth in the building. And so again, we're, we wanna maximize the airflow, but not go too far. All right, so with that, we will wrap up. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I hope you can see that, that our team is working really, really hard to work through this, all of the issues, uh, and, 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 and now we'll begin disseminating how we're gonna carry out all the policies to individual units. Um, read Inside Missouri State, read Cliff Notes, read the Provost Communique, We'll have an updated uh, return to campus guide by the 9th. Uh, go on our COVID website. It is updated regularly. Uh, and then finally, uh, send me any questions, president at missouristate.edu, and we will endeavor to answer them. Thanks for all that you do for the university.